Hampton just for this. So welcome, glad to have you, glad to see you here. Um, you know, if you're just uh, logging in for this, my name is Sami Abu Saad, um, but you all know me. Um, our founder and CEO is Greg Capra. He's the only six-time winner of the Money Show Live Trading Challenge. Just incredible to, to have that feat. And tonight, we're going to talk about supply-demand imbalance, pictures of power. When a picture of power is actually not the way, not what, not what you're supposed to be looking for, not the answer, right? Or not necessary. When a picture of power is not necessary. And truly, truly, why stocks move the way they do? Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, and hey, Fred, how are you? Any questions before I get started? Are there any questions? All right. Let me take a sip of water here because I am. <laughs> and then we'll get going, okay? Yes, this webinar is recorded. You can get a copy of the recording by emailing your counselor. All right. So some general information for you here. We all know that stock prices change because of supply and demand. Right, guys? If we don't, raise your hand. If you don't know that or if you disagree with it, anything you have, any questions you have, feel free, okay? If more people want to buy a stock than sell it, the stock price should go up. If more people want to sell a stock than buy it, the stock price should fall. In other words, it's the imbalance in the supply-demand forces that causes stock prices to fluctuate. Uh, are we in agreement so far? Um, no, this is, hey, 527, this is not part two. It is not part two. Part two is going to be, I'll tell you when, uh, part two is going to be on April, I'm going to be teaching that on April 6th, April 6th, so that's next week, I guess, part two. All right, you are most welcome. So it's the imbalance in the supply-demand relationship uh, that causes stock prices to fluctuate. All right. Um, okay, let me read your question there, Tony. Confusing knowing the stock moves as a dependent of internal of market than internal movements. Okay. Um, okay, so you're saying sometimes you're not sure whether the stock is moving as a result of the market internals or because of it on its own. Is that what you're saying? You're sometimes you're you're not sure whether the stock is moving is uh, you know is moving as a result of the pattern that it has that it's showing or maybe based on the market internal is that kind of what you're saying um okay which oh, okay which depends on the okay which is dependent on the other uh, market internals is basically or the market itself um is um is basically uh I want to say I was going to say the average. I'll go ahead and say the average or the the uh, the what's the word here? It's the sum of all stocks, right? It's the sum of all stocks. So it's kind of like asking which comes first, the chicken or the I mean the the, the chick the chicken or the egg, right? If, you know when some some stocks have a huge effect on the market like Apple used to have to make up 15% of the QQQ, the NASDAQ 100. So when Apple moved, the market followed suit, believe it or not. Um, but having said that, um, you know, so the market, uh, typically if, if a stock is, uh, typically it's the market that depends, I mean the stock that depends on the market, not the other way around. So, okay, if something is reacting to something, then it's, it's the stock reacting to the market, not the market reacting to an individual stock. But what is the market? Well, the market is the sum of all stocks. So does that make sense? So both they're codependent. 
there is a relationship there. Now, most stocks are not significant enough, even Apple, right? Even Microsoft, even Intel, even, right? They're not significant enough to cause a move in the market in and of themselves, right? Just by themselves. Um, but if, let's say, Apple were to collapse one day due to news on it, some news about, about the stock, then it will probably move the market with it, yeah? It will move the market with it. So, all right, so why don't we pay more attention to the internals? We do, we, we use the market, we look at the market on every single trade. Who said we don't? Now you can use the tick and the trend and you know, the advanced decline line and whatever to assess the internals or you can also use and or you can use the, you can chart the market itself, put the market itself on a chart and take your trades with the market, right? So trade in sync with the market, not against it. All right, okay, very good. So let's keep, let's get going here first, and then we can delve into this in more detail. So it's the imbalance, supply demand imbalance is what causes prices to change. And this is, I did this just, uh, oops, I meant to go forward, not backward. I did this on on the weekend. I I, I wrote this um, uh, did the, these slides on the weekend here. So this is all current as of um, as of yesterday. I mean, as of yesterday. Yes, as of last night. Here's the weekly chart of KR, weekly chart of TDW, right? Uptrend, downtrend. Tony, if you don't mind, I need to get going, and then I can analyze your question. I can. I can get more questions from you later, but I need to keep keep going here. So, would you agree that there's more buying than selling in KR? Would you agree that there's more buying than selling in KR? Otherwise, why would the stock be rising? The same can be said about TW, but in reverse, more selling than buying. How many how many people would agree with that? Can I, by show of hands, can I get a yes or a Y or a one? Hey, Corvette. Hey, Ethan. Uh, no, Ryan. <laughs> hey, John. Hey, guys. All right. So more buying than selling, more selling than buying. Then if you disagree, if can I get a two? Can I get a two or an N or a no if you disagree? If you disagree, can I get in two or, right? Come on, guys. Ryan. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, come on. We have over 100 people in here. More of you disagree and agree. Anybody else? Hey, Beaker. I disagree. So then explain to me, please, why stocks move. If it's not more buying than selling, then what is it that made KR go up? What was it that made KR go up? What was it that made KR go up? What was it that made TDW sell off like this from 55 to 19? Again, all of this material is current as of yesterday. I, I worked on this just yesterday. It's not whether there's more buying versus what? It's not whether buying or selling is going on and the bid and the ask. It has nothing to do with the bid and the ask. Don't they have to to move because buyers are willing to pay more for them? Pressure on the ask. Nobody's selling, so it's going up. Huh? <laughs> Isn't that <laughs> this is like the fund the fundamental questions in trading? Isn't it? Yeah. Isn't, isn't this the fundamental question to trading, which, which is what makes prices move? Why stocks move? Why prices change? And I think if you don't understand that, that's, a basic, that's the foundation um, to the, our business. So you got to understand this. And I'm going to share with you what I do, do understand about, about it, about this topic specifically. Shouldn't there always be, right, so more buying than selling, I'm saying more buying than selling, up uptrend. More selling than buying, downtrend. All right, 
wait a second. But I thought for every buyer there is a seller. But what if there is not? I love that. <laughs> okay. But what if there is not? <laughs> the questions for you is, uh, oops, what is that? Is it true? Uh, is it 100% true? Is it 100% true that there is a buyer for every seller? Yes or no? Just all I need is a yes or no. Is it 100% true that there is a buyer for every seller? Can I get a yes or a no answer, please? Yes or no. There really is not a trick question. Truly is not a trick question. I'm just trying to get a yes or no answer. Okay. If you say no, I see three no's, right? I see three answers with a no. How could you, how could you buy something from somebody that's not selling it? How could you sell something to somebody that's not buying? There is. For every buyer, there is a seller. Then if that's the case, which I am saying is the case, for every buyer, there is a seller. If, I'm, if I have a chair and I'm selling you my chair, I mean, in, in order for me to sell it, there has to be somebody willing to buy it, right? Just, just like real life, for every buyer, there is a seller. Uh, the, not the same price, then there would be no transaction. Imagine me selling, trying to sell you the, pri the chair, the, my office chair here, for $500. And you're saying, nope, I'm only willing to pay, it, pay $200 then there would be no transaction. So for every buyer, there is a seller at that price, at that price. If that is true, which I am saying is true, then what in the world is the real reason why stocks change? I mean, why stocks, I'm sorry, why stock prices change? What is the real reason? See, it, this is what I love, by the way. I'm passionate about understanding the nature of price movement and the psychology behind it, right? So let's hear, if anybody want to participate? Um, it's not the same price. It is, so we said it's the same, it has to be the same price. Perception of fear and greed, more demand for the stock, but more demand, there's a buyer for, there's a seller for every buyer. At any given price level, demand is not the, in sync with supply. Actually, that's incorrect. That's incorrect. At any given price, demand and supply are in 100% one, in sync. If that weren't, was not true, the stock wouldn't be trading at that price. Think about it. Just really take the time to think about it. If that wasn't true, the stock would not be there. It would be somewhere else. There is always... Com uh, uh, harmony between supply and demand. And the word is willing. I like that word, uh, Jay. Expected profits. Um, hey, Hannah. Uh, there is a trade printed. Again, there's, uh, we're not, I'm not trying, there's no right or wrong. Well, there is, but we're just having a discussion here. We're just, I'm just having a discussion with you. Supply is greater, price falls to absorb it. Demand is strong, buyers willing to pay till the seller is there. There is always a seller. Okay, so what is the real reason? <laughs> it is a little bit perplexing, no, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. The, uh, is Sam, uh, Sam E.L., I think the answer is correct, yes. Um, this is simple, basic economics, the law of supply and demand. Okay, <laughs> can't be, <laughs> all right. It is, actually, it is actually truly that. Trader 88 puts it beautifully. It's really this law of supply and demand. Let's, take, let's do an example. Um, let's let's kind of run through an example. Let's say uh, you're at the, you know, let's say there is, a, um, I, I always use the same example, which is strawberries. Right, but it can be anything, any fruit, anything in the world. Uh, there is a, uh, you know, you're at the farmer's market, you're at the grocery store, and there is a, a strawberries are in, se in, the, in season right now. There's a lot of strawberries. Um, imagine, Im imagine this. There is, let's say, a hundred people in the store. Um, 
in it, and then the the, the 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 grocery stores trying to sell, um, you know, trying to sell get rid of their uh, the, the thousand baskets that they have at hand, right? On hand, uh, imagine them uh, raising the price. Would anybody buy? I mean, in order to get rid of what you have, don't you have to lower your price? Isn't that basic supply and demand? Uh, right, guys? Uh, if you're trying to uh, get out of what you have or sell what you have, right? If you're trying to sell what you have, you, you don't ask top dollar for your, for your product or your produce in this case, right? You actually uh, you're more willing to say, okay, my goal is to my goal is to get rid of the baskets, to uh, to sell the, those baskets, uh, strawberry baskets. That's the goal. Then you lower your price, or you you basically you just want to offload them. If um, let's say there was only uh, five baskets, and there's a hundred people coming to the store to buy strawberries. There's a hundred people coming to the store to buy those five baskets that you have. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you have to actually go down? Uh, do you have to, to? Can't you ask for top price? You are probably going to ask for top dollar, for top price, right, guys? Because there's a lot of demand for what you have, which is very little, right? Very little supply. So it's supply demand now. In trading, it's really, if I were to just give you one word to keep in mind, the word would be chase, chasing. Who is cha Just always ask yourself, who is chasing who? Right? It, are sellers selling to the buyers, or are buyers taken away from the sellers? Does that make sense? So who's coming, who, who wants, you know, there's always a, buy, a seller for every buyer. No doubt about that. But there's always a, a sell side and a buy side. It, does, it could be one seller to every thousand, a thousand buyers. It could be just one big seller. It could be also a small seller. So, so there is always a, a buyer and a seller. Um, but the the one thing is who is who's chasing who? Is it the buyers buying from the sellers, or is it the sellers kind of selling down to the buyers? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So, does that make sense? So this is what actually, this is what you have to keep in mind. Who, so the question is who is more, who is pursuing who? Or who is more aggressive? Are the buyers trying, are the buyers going after the supply or are the sellers just trying to dump their, uh, uh, what they have? It's kind of like the grocery store example that I gave you. Is it, you know, is the grocery store worried about selling their five baskets, or are they, uh, are they, are they, do they feel certain that they're going to be able to sell their five bas baskets of strawberries? Now, if these are one thousand baskets of strawberries, they're probably going to be, you know, lowering the price. It's the same thing, right? It's the same thing. If they're both, if there's no, if the supply demand, if nobody's chasing nobody, right? If they're both at the same level, so to speak, that's when the price goes sideways. That's when the price goes. That's when the price goes sideways, because they're at an equilibrium, so to speak. Okay. All right. Yeah, exactly. That's the question, Lee Harris. That's the question. Is who is it the buyers that are chasing the sellers? Is it the buyers that are buying from the sellers or is it the sellers that are selling to the buyers? So who is more aggressive? Who is chasing who? Like I said, that's the real question. And that, my friends, is what moves the market. Or that's how price how how prices the stock prices change. In a sense, everything we do in trading is in search of stocks that have high demand supply imbalances. So when I say there is a demand supply imbalance, what do I mean? We said there is a buyer for every seller, right? We already agreed on that. 
What do I mean when I say there's a high demand supply imbalance? It's, remember that grocery store example. Is, are there 1,000 baskets of strawberries, or is there only five baskets of strawberries? Are there 1,000 buyers of strawberries, or just five buyers of strawberries? So that's the supply-demand imbalance that I'm talking about. I am, what I'm talking about is potential supply-demand imbalance. For every transaction, there is a buyer and a seller. For every transaction. What I'm talking about is the potential, I mean, the future transactions. Are they going to be the buyers going after the sellers or the sellers going after the buyers? That's the question to keep in mind. So I, I, I trust that point is, even though I, I don't think I really used the perfect example there, I trust that, that you have a good understanding now of, what, of, of what's happening here, okay? So when I use a term like demand, supply, and balance, you don't get um, you know, thrown off guard, so to speak, or you don't get confused, you don't get confused. So in a sense, everything we do in trading is in search of stocks that have high demand supply imbalances. Determining whether a stock has more demand or supply involves assessing the big picture and truly, truly understanding what's going on with the stock. Once that is done, our job becomes to find a high probability entry pattern using the proper time frame of focus. Then enter, set stop and target, and manage until the trade comes to fruition or stops out. So, so Again, in a sense, everything we do is in search of those stocks that have high demand supply imbalances. In order to determine, or how we determine that is by looking at analyzing the big picture and, and understanding what's truly going on with the stock, right? Uh, having, you know, so this is, so trading is, is a, um, so the traders that make it in this business are at least one quality of all traders that I met that make it in this business are ones that have a good feel for the big picture. A good feel for the big picture. I've probably met individuals in the past that have, um, you know, a good feel for the big picture, right? They have a good feel for the big picture in situations. Well, the same in trading, right? But this is when it comes to charts. Right? Okay. Once we do that, once that is done, our job becomes to find high probability entry patterns uh, using the proper time frame of focus. Um, you know, you can't be looking to play necessarily a monthly buy setup using a one-minute chart. While you might have read the picture correctly on the monthly chart that this stock has high demand supply imbalance, you're using the wrong time frame. You see what I mean? So it's not only important to, to be able to assess the big picture and, and to find that high probability pattern, but it's also important to use the right time frame. Everything is important. Uh, what does the imbalance look like on a chart? Perfect, perfect question. Corvette, we're getting there. We're getting there. You just, I'm driving, I'm driving my Audi, you're driving your Corvette. I mean, I can't keep up with you here. <laughs> Okay, let's take a look at a few examples, all right? Here is some examples. So, now, I did not go back and, and just, um, you know, to, uh, and used examples from the past. I only used my trades from the previous week, from last week. All the charts that you're going to see are from just last week. This is the daily chart. Um, and here it is, right? This is the day that I bought it. Now, look, how do I know? How can you tell? Or what was your question, Corvette? What does the imbalance look like on the chart? You see this? This is an example of a, a demand supply imbalance. Why? Because the stock was breaking out on the larger time frame. See this? Clearing resistance on the larger time frame. Now, you can also you have to incorporate I think the market the market fell apart uh, the previous couple of days this stock based at the highs what does that tell you 
what does that tell you? The supply, any supply that's coming on the stock, any selling, the, the, the buyers are there in, in a big way to absorb it. Does that make sense? That's what that tells me. Basing at the highs, while the market falls hard, tells me there's a lot of demand for the stock. Oh, wait a second, but I thought there's, there's a buyer for every seller. What do you mean there's a lot of demand? I already explained that, right guys? We already explained what it means to, to have, to say, to say that there's a lot of demand versus a lot of supply, even though it's true that there is a buyer for every seller. So there's a lot of demand for the stock, and then the stock on the day that I took the trade, the stock breaks above the resistance, right? Breaks above that, what we call as resistance, which is an area where the sellers held the stock you know, the stock couldn't go past that area because there's a, an abundance of sellers, right? There's an abundance of sellers. That's why the stock cannot go past an, a certain area. All right. Um, so, and then, and then what did I say the steps are? The steps are you use the, you find a high probability pattern. Uh, what's the high probability pattern? A base breakout is a high probability pattern. This was played actually. Okay, so we're going to go into this in more detail. This was the trade. Now, I didn't actually take, one second, please. Oops, uh, what did I do? I meant to do this. I meant to, I didn't take the second trade, by the way. I only took the first trade. And, uh, you know, I, I, I did a lousy job managing it, actually. I, I got out there. The trade made on a $500 risk unit, it uh, made 900 bucks on a $500 risk unit. So. We start with the larger picture, right? That's the, that's the first step. And analyze and see if this is a, an example of a high demand supply imbalance or not. If it is, then we look for the proper time frame. Now, how do you know that two minutes was the proper time frame? That would be the subject of another topic. That would be totally different. You know, I wouldn't be able to cover that today. So that's the time frame I, I, I chose. And a high probability pattern was this. Now, this trade, the stop was right here. The entry was right here. I mean, it could have been a 10 to 1. But I played it as a scalp. I played it as a scalp, so I actually got out the whole thing right there. Okay, very, very tiny compared to what, I, what could have been. Okay. Very good. Let's go to the next trade. This is all this week, right? These are all trades uh, from this week. This is a daily chart. And here is that day where I played it. Now, again, the market fell apart. This thing actually got bought the last three days, so a lot of relative strength. Today, the stock gaps up a little bit, right, and pulls back and gives me that PBS. It, it's a retest and failure PBS. What's a retest and failure is when you, you know, you get the initial PBS and then it doesn't go, and then you retest it, and it fails. It, what, what fails? It fails to go lower. And so the entry would be here, the stop would be there. This, it never got to the target. That was the target up there. And I actually got it a little bit late. The entry was supposed to be over 13 right here. This is WBAI. I got it at 18, so it was late. And it never got to the target, so I sold it at the end of the day here. Yeah, that's, that's this play. Now, the relative strength, but it's not only the relative strength to the market that made me like this. Now, this stock is on my radar already because of what happened that day. This is a day when the stock gapped down 20-some percent and got bought. See, when the stock gaps down and the stock gets bought like this, look at the volume, what does that tell you? That tells you institutional buyers took a that tells you institutional buyers took advantage of the large supply available that day. A lot of people were dumping that stock, right? They took advantage of it and they bought the stock. They bought the stock and bought it in a big way. So this stock is pretty bullish. Now, this is also kind of like climactic on the daily. So I know that the next sell setup should fail, and that's the sell setup. Look at the volume there, no follow through to the downside, and then higher. So I like this stock. I certainly, I really like this stock. By the way, this is the WBAI. Did anybody play this with me today? I played it um, as a climactic. 
right? Made some good money on it. WBAI. All right. Here's another play. This is, oh, you missed it. Uh, correct. Okay. Here's another one. Now we start with a larger time frame. Now, why is this a picture of a, a supply demand imbalance? Can somebody tell me why? Why was this a picture of a good supply demand imbalance? Why? It's because of this. Here's your answer. Gapping stocks, in this case it was a pro gap down, have shock value and set up the unexpected, meaning you know you're you know, you go to sleep thinking your stock is trading at, uh, you know, I mean, knowing that your stock is trading at 28, the next day you wake up and it's, you know, it's it's trading at 23 bucks. I mean, it's a total disaster. So what's what do you do? Most people, they just decide to exit their position. They decide to, to sell. Uh, their selling starts a snowball effect. So somebody starts selling, the other person starts, you know, you get a thousand people trying to get out of the stock at the same time. And there might be some demand for the stock at the lower prices, but certainly the demand, who's chasing who? Who are, who are the aggressive, who's the aggressive group? The sellers or the, the buyers? The sellers. The sellers are just trying to dump the stock. Now add to that the group of professional traders who know this and add fuel to the fire, so to speak. They short it, they, right? So that no, starts the snowball effect and, and the stock drops. So gaps set up the, the unexpected and, and so, you know, this is what is known as shock value right, to the stock. You know, it just, it creates a shock value. And, um, and you know, people are, you know, you go, again, you, imagine buying the stock at $28 the night before and then the next day you wake up and the stock is at 23. And now you may think, well, uh, yeah, but how many people bought it like, uh, you know, bought it at 28 and, well, maybe a thousand people, not a whole lot of people, but it's not only yesterday. It's, it's uh, several months. I mean, it's uh, what, how many months? It's like several months worth of buying every single person that bought it. And I'm talking you, me, everybody, but I'm also talking about the, the institutional buyers, talking about the banks, talking about, right, hedge funds. Anybody that bought it is underwater on that gap down. That gives you a good um, clue that there is going to be a high supply demand imbalance and play it short. Now, again, these are not necessarily, I didn't necessarily do the best job on, I'm just showing you some of the trades this last week. Last week, I, my trades, at least in the room, made 16 and a half hours. I actually had a much better week than that, but my trades made 16 and a half hours, uh, risk units, hours is a risk unit. So I took this short on, uh, this went right, I tried to short it at the open at uh, under 40, so 24, 40, I guess, at the open, skipped. It's on an uptick. I tried to short it at 20, or no, at 26, I believe. It dropped to 06. It just, I couldn't get filled. So I missed this at the open, and then I shorted it on this 1, 2, 3. See this 1, 2, 3? So I, I did it, I played it on the 1, 2, 3, and I played it as a scalp. I thought this was done, and I pro covered it probably just right there. I don't know exactly what the, and it just, much lower. So my play made 3.3 Rs, which on a $500 risk unit was, was 16.65. Just that one trade alone, okay, 16.65 in a matter of a few minutes. In a matter of a few minutes, um, 1,600 bucks. All right, so that's that. Here's another trade. The stock, this is um, Air, uh, Airman or Airm, okay. The stock gap down, this is just a few days ago, um, gap, gap down, and then rallied hard. This is what we know as a PSS, right? We know this as a PSS and into minor resistance. Uh, why was this, why was this a, a stock that I focused on, zoomed in on? Is because it was a gap, right? A professional gap. I took it short and out right there, of course, the stock decided to drop how many dollars? Three dollars, right? From about 48 
to 45 is two and a half dollars. Incredible. I just captured a small move out of it and made, you know, again, just more than an hour, an hour and a half almost. Okay. The important thing is to, to see why I picked that stock or I went over it. Okay. All right. Now, the next steps we have discussed pictures of what we've discussed so far is pictures what we know at pristine or what we call at pristine as pictures of power or picture of power on the macro time frames typically the daily the weekly charts are what we consider the macro time frame as they can and often do translate into big moves on the micro time frames the smaller time frames the intraday time frames the 1 minute 2 minute 5 minute 15 minute chart okay we focus on pictures of powers, uh, power because they provide a clear sign of demand when there's demand supply imbalance. It is this imbalance that causes stocks to, to make big moves on the intraday time frame. Okay, it is this imbalance that causes stocks to make big moves. Now let's take this discussion a step further and talk about each intraday what each intraday pattern means. Okay. Now the discussion is getting a little bit more interesting, I think. Uh, you may, you know, you remember this trade. This was the first trade I showed you, right? And um, I don't know why not everything is coming up on the chart here. One second. Oh, what's going on? Interesting. All right. Oops. Okay, let's go back. Uh, we said the stock rallied. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. We said the stock rallied uh, that day because of the picture of power on the daily chart. Are we in agreement so far? Uh, can I get a yes to know that you're there and listening and we're on the same page? And can I get a yes, a one, anything you want? Okay, so we said that. The stock rallied that day on the two-minute time frame in this case, on the intraday time frame, because of the larger time frame, right? Very good. Excellent. Now, I have a question for you. Why does a stock, why did this stock, which has a lot of demand, why did it go sideways instead of just straight up? Why do stocks go sideways? I mean, if it's a bullish stock, why does a bullish stock go sideways? Does anybody know the answer? Does anybody know the answer? It, it take a breath, but I mean, it's not a human being to take a breath. I mean, let's be more uh, precise in our description. There's still too much supply. Hmm. Equal buyers and sellers. You know, I would say that uh, little volume, sellers, oversold. You see how... Uh, we're all over the place here. Increasing price invites selling. Consolidation. It is a consolidation, but why? Why do stocks consolidate? Profit taking. Mm -hmm. Need sellers to continue up. Okay. I mean, I, I appreciate and respect some of the answers for sure. I appreciate all your answers. The resistance. Hmm. Does anybody actually know what the difference is between resistance and supply? We use these words and support and demand. We use these words interchangeably, but they're not actually the same thing. Right? Resistance does not exactly mean supply. Supply refers to what could potentially be resistance. Right? Supply refers to an area that can become resistance if, that, if the sellers decide to sell. So it's an air, so supply refers to an air, so supply is potential resistance, but it doesn't have to be resistance. Okay? So supply refers to the sellers. Resistance refers to uh, what will happen, the reaction of the stock when the sellers actually decide to sell. The same with demand and support. Demand is, refers to, you know, I don't want to go over it again. It's the same thing, right? Demand refers to, uh, or support becomes 
I'm, I'm sorry, demand becomes support if buyers step up and buy that, that stock. They're not exactly the same. They're, they're not exactly. So I just told you what the difference is, right? Okay. Um, is it, let me ask you, let me make the question more specific. Let me make the question more specific. Is it typically um, one big seller or is it multiple sellers? When you get a base like this, when we get a bullish base, there are bullish bases, there are bearish bases. If the stock continues higher after the base, that's a bullish base. When you get a bullish base, is it multiple sellers or is it typically one seller? It's multiple sellers, Brian's saying. Multiple. Um, okay. When it's a really tight base, when it's a really tight base, it's typically one seller, one big seller, or a few big sellers. I mean, but it's not thousands of sellers in that area, especially if that area, if you look to the left and there's nothing to the left, why would anybody be selling it there? Well, it's because somebody decided to take advantage of the high demand for the stock, right, and, and exit their position, basically liquidate their position. So it's typically one or two or three sellers, but it's not just, there's no resistance to the left. Now having said that, the reason why stocks go sideways, it could be multiple reasons. It could be many different reasons. It could be because of one big seller, but it could also be uh, <coughs> that the one big seller that's decided to liquidate their position, but it could also be because the buyers uh, are taking, you know, remember somebody said, Taking, taking a breath, I think Tony said that. It, it is true to some extent that uh, the buyers are taking, taking a breather. I mean, they're just take, right now they're not pushing the buttons. Why? Because they see the market falling apart. They're not, so they're, they're, they're a little bit, they're not pushing it. The market is not ready, the market is coming in, right? There's maybe news coming out on the stock. We see stocks go sideways all the time, right before news comes out on the stock. Why? Because in anticipation of the of the news announcement, nobody's willing to take action. Not a lot of people are willing to buy, and yet the stock is bullish, not a lot of people willing to sell. But the point is, typically it's one or two or three big sellers, not multiple sellers. Not, not a lot of sellers when the stock goes sideways and the stock is bullish. So got it? This is GLOB. Yeah, ask me about the symbols, sorry. The reason why somebody asked me the other day, why do you hide the symbols? Is because if I want to use this slide in the future, then you know when you take out the, the when you remove the symbol, then it becomes timeless. You know it, because what we teach at Pristine, um, and then because some people are you know like they 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 think it's they become attached to the symbol. I, when I scan, I don't look at the symbol honestly. When I'm scanning, I only jot down the symbol when I when I, I get interested in the stock. So it's actually, I like to not see the symbol. I, not, I like to not know what the name is. Now for you, you might want to go back and review that chart. So fine, you know, just ask me for the symbol and I'll tell you what it is. It is GLOB, G-L-O-B. Okay, very good. Now let's talk about this chart. This was the second trade. Guys, I'm not picking fancy trades here for you. This is kind of an ugly chart. But I'm just showing you, again, just from last week. I'm not going, you know, and picking out the best trade. Now, why do strong stocks pull back? If there is more demand than supply for the stock, or if there's a more, you know, there's the, the, the buyers are more of uh, the aggressive group, uh, why do stocks pull back then? What's the, what's the first answer that you should give me? There are many answers, but the first one. What's the main reason? Quickly, please. Um, anybody else? Hey, Jay, how are you? Jay got it right. Yeah, and Corvette. Yeah, it's it's profit takers. It's profit takers. So let me ask you this then. If you thought the stock is higher and it's bullish and you're playing it long, why would you take profits? Why would you exit the stock? Why would you exit the stock that you think is bullish and look, and you, that's why you're in it? 
why do, typically why do you uh, why would you take profit we all do it I do it you do it quickly guys we're I'm really kind of behind today on my wow it's almost it's six o'clock I am behind but this is only getting more interesting so if you can don't go anywhere reach the target rarely it's the reaching the target thing but it is true sometimes you know it reaches you reach the target it's rare though that it's it's the real reason people don't have targets people are not aware of target that you that in trading you 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 pick targets if, exactly ARCX it's fear of giving back their profit that's the main reason okay and uh, uh, Amit Amit uh, that's true it's uh, the same thing it's it's what I it's what we call or what I call the what do I call them the doubters the doubters they start doubting that the stock will continue or they're afraid that it, they think it's going to continue but they're not sure anymore and they don't want to give back their money so they take their they exit okay all right uh, are all pullbacks equal are all pullbacks equal anybody no they're not I'll give you the answer because I'm behind like I said I need to keep going here they're not now what is the difference between a bullish pullback and a bearish pullback what is the difference between a bullish pullback and a bearish pullback all right hmm a volume uh, rarely is volume the, the 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 reason rarely is volume reason no no it's just you, you know i want you to know this and don't take it personally if i say that. just get this volume thing out of your mind more just people think about give volume way too much than it actually credit than it deserves meaning volume has nothing to do with anything 99% of the time or 95% of the time really volume is only important under one circumstance almost there, there are three times when it's important but only one time where I really give it uh, give it yeah I pay attention to it <coughs> excuse me I'm losing my voice there's only one time that I really truly pay attention to it the rest of the times it's not that it's not that big of a deal okay all right uh, the difference between a bullish and a bearish pullback is uh, is uh, is what we teach at Pristine, right? Um, you know, the bullish pullback, we know what a bullish pullback looks like, right? A bullish pullback is when the stock maintains the integrity of the, of the prior move, doesn't pull back too much, right? Does it in a slow um, uh, fashion, you know, in, in a 45 degree angle, um, you know, stops at prior support, a bearish pullback would be something like this pretty deep um, <clears throat> big bar started the pullback big topping tail we don't see the volume but volume again is important at the beginning and at the end of the move is when it's important um, the angle is pretty steep you know it's really sharp retracement rather than a 45 degree um, yeah now what is what does that mean uh, all of that what does it mean when there is a, a, a steeper pullback versus a 45 degree pullback anybody mm. uh, fear selling rather than just profit taking yeah it could be right panic selling but I don't think it's panic selling when the stock is uptrending it's not panic when the stock goes climactic, then maybe, and it, it falls. It's more, more so institutional selling. Okay, it's more institutional big selling. It's no longer normal profit taking. A bearish pullback is a pullback, and I'm not going to go into the characteristics of a bearish pullback. I'll tell you real quick. Don't ask me about it uh, right now because I won't have the time. But I'll tell you what it, the characteristics are. Um, you know, the, the 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 speed in which the pullback, the stock pulls back in. It's a fast pull. It happens really. It starts out really fast. It starts from a wide range bar. It's it it's a, the the angle is pretty steep. There is a failure pattern at the top. 
there's big volume when the stock starts to break in. The, the pullback is deep, right? Those are all characteristics. The bigger the bars at the top, uh, at the pivot, the more likely this is a bearish pullback. Again, the existence of any failure patterns at the top, like a breakout failure. Every rounding top has a failure pattern in it. Um, you know, so th those are what makes what constitutes a bearish pullback. Now, what is needed to make a bearish pullback playable? What is needed to make a bearish pullback playable? Anybody? Uh, time could be one of them. So t time is not a bad answer at all. Time is true. A volume again. <laughs> no, not volume. But that's a good one. Uh, actually, if you expand on it, your answer, I, would, I might accept the answer. A failed pattern. Yeah. It basically, let, let me just summarize all of that, a higher low failed pattern. Let me summarize it by saying, um, a, a basically, a secondary sign of strength that proves that the stock is still okay, that the stock, despite the bearish pullback, the stock is not really totally ruined or damaged. Does that make sense? So it's a secondary sign of strength, which typically means short-term failure, like a double bottom, a breakdown failure, or sometimes, as my friend Ryan said, healing through time. Why is time, why does time fix, let's say, a bearish pullback? Why does time fix a bearish pullback? Anybody? Quickly, though. We don't have a lot of time. I know you guys need to catch dinner. I haven't had lunch yet, either. I'm on the West Coast. <laughs> because, pe because we can't No, Time heals all wounds. Don't we say that? Because we can't. Don't, the, when, you're, when you're in trouble, when you're underwater, you don't have that much patience to sit with the stock. You don't have that much patience. You're watching every tick, every move. And the stock decides to go sideways for four hours, you end up dumping it and say, I'm moving on. You can't take the pain anymore. Does that make sense? So time, is, as, as the stock continues to go sideways, people will just start to get out of it. Does that make sense? So the weak hands, now what are these weak hands? The weak hands that got hurt in this bearish pullback. Let's just say this was a bearish pullback, actually. In this case, it was not time. It was the retest and failure. So the failure to continue lower, and then the stock goes higher. And I know the stock is not damaged. The rising 20 is there, still at minor support, still a bullish daily. It was fine. Just It just needed a little bit of time and that retest and failure to fix itself. OK? All right, very good. Let's take a look at this stock. Why did this weak stock, which I shorted, we discussed that this is, why did this weak stock rally? It actually rallied two bucks, 46 to, 40, 40 to 48. Why would such a weak stock decide to rally? Anybody? Quickly. Why would a weak stock actually rally? Short covering, very unlikely. Uh, short covering. Yeah, it's because, no, it's not capitulation. Gaps don't create capitulation. It's because it gapped to support. See this area? Anybody that bought it in this area was rewarded handsomely. The stock gaps down to that area also. So this is an area of demand. Now, yes, there were, I'm sure, I'm sure shorts that uh, wanted to ring the cash register, right? and make money and cover it. But the main reason is because it, it gapped down to a large support area. That's why we don't short at support, right? The truth is we can sh short at support. We can short at support. But you, you have to have other conditions in place before you are, you, you're permitted to short at support. Does that make sense? So that's why, in this case, the stock rallied. OK? All right. Um, very good. So let's continue. We have discussed how strong supply-demand imbalances often translate into big intraday moves. We have not yet discussed another situation that puts the odds in our favor and provides big dollars, 
if played correctly. This is what's known as climactic or novice gap plays. In this particular scenario, we do not play long because the stock has strong demand. So again, we do not play long because the stock has strong demand or short because the stock has heavy supply. We play long due to the absence of supply or the sheer exhaustion of it and short due to the absence of demand or sheer exhaustion of it. Take a minute to let this sink in and really understand. Some of you immediately know what I'm talking about. Others don't. Take some time to really analyze this. Maybe not now, but in the evening, later. Again, only from this past week. I just, you know, I'm only showing you trades from this week, last week. This is HOT, H-O-T, actually, if you want the symbol. And so since this trade depends on lack of demand, it is not necessary. So since this trade depends on lack of demand, it is not necessary to have a macro event, like a picture, a bearish picture of power on the daily chart. Since this stock depends on lack of demand rather than the abundance of supply, it is not necessary to have a bearish picture of power. If the daily is also up several bars in a row, the trade's favorable odds are increased dramatically. Meaning, if there is you know, a daily that's extended to the upside that's also showing that there, the stock is running out of buyers on every time frame, then yes, that puts the odds in your favor even more. But you see this? This was a short. I played it short twice. Here and the first short and then there. But I, I didn't hold until there just to here. And it made over two hours. It made over two hours. So now question for you, why do stocks go climactic? Hmm. Why are there steep trends versus 45 degree trends versus flatter price movements? Huh, we kind of talked about that. We didn't really get into the details of it. Why do greed? Okay, that's true. There's a better answer than that, though. There is a better answer than that. Why, why is it that on some stocks there is greed, on others there is no greed? Explain that, please. See what I mean? Why is it that, oh, only on this stock there's greed? What about the other stocks that are bullish and have incredibly powerful pictures of power, right, on the macro events on the daily charts? Hmm. No news, no supply. It is not the absence of supply that we're talking about. No. Fear of missing out. Uh, what about that? No, no more buyers. No, it's not the sellers that disappear. It's the doubters that disappear. Nobody's doubting the ability of the stock to, to, to come in anymore. They're all thinking, this is, the symbol is hot. This thing is hot going to the moon, baby. Right, that's what they're thinking. So they don't sell anymore. Does that make sense? So it's the absence of the doubters. It's the conviction, right? When there's too much conviction amongst the buyers that the stock is going to continue higher and it's going to continue more, higher, right up, they don't sell anymore. That's what causes stocks to go climactic. That's when you look at the stock and say greed is extreme. Analyzing and understanding the nature of the market and the psychology of price movement is the beginning of trading mastery. It's the beginning of that love story that you have to fall into if you are to make it as a profitable professional trader. Okay, if that makes any sense uh, to anybody. Um, this was uh, uh, another trade here. This wasn't uh, so. Take a look. Novice gaps are also traded for the same reason. Uh, uh, traded the same for the same reason. Intraday climactics, climactics are traded, which is the lack of demand or supply, even of even if just on a temporary basis. So, what I'm trying to say here is. Novice gaps on the daily chart is the same as a, an intraday climactic. So, so, so it, we, I play a novice gap not because the stock is not bearish. The stock can be the most bearish stock in the world, and I will still play it long 
um, because the stock uh, at the, uh, has short-term exhaustion amongst the sellers. Right now, there is short-term exhaustion. Then I'll play it. Sometimes there's short-term exhaustion, there's long-term exhaustion. I mean, er, the sellers are just completely exhausted. That is when you get, let me go back and show you what you get. Uh, that's when you get this. I don't know where it is, that trade. The WBAI, I don't know where it is. Here it is. That's when you get this. Short-term, it gets bought and it goes from, you know, from, I don't know, it doubles in a few days. Right? That's when you get that. So this was, I don't know where it is. Here it is. This was just bare stock for sure broke down the, on the daily time frame, but big red bar and then, and then a gap down. So this played from here to there. It wasn't much. And then the stock uh, came in after that and didn't really go anywhere because the market absolutely f fell apart that day. This is ARMH. Thanks, uh, Frankie. So, okay. So this is uh, this the, you know this was just a small move because the stock market fell apart, and then this was also an ADR, not a real, uh, not a real, uh, not a U.S. common stock. This is uh, uh, okay. Take a look at this. This is a climactic, right? This was a, a climactic. Note the daily. In this case, while we do not need a picture of power on the daily, the daily is actually bullish. Notice that the daily is bullish. Intraday, though, the stock reached an exhaustion, uh, what do we call an exhaustion stage. Right, guys? Now, if you are familiar with uh, the pristine method or have taken my class, advanced scalping techniques, was this a full or a mini climactic? Was this a full or a mini? Uh, mini, right guys, mini. Now, was this a high quality or a low quality mini? Based on the daily, don't look at the intraday. I'm just talking about the daily. A high quality or a low quality mini, based on the daily chart only. Don't look at the intraday. Uh, George is saying low quality, see, see no answers. You need to know, if, you're, if you trade this kind of stuff, immediately you know this, the answer you immediately should know the answer. Shouldn't have any doubts at all. If you do, that's, that's gonna hinder your ability from, you know, when I look at a chart, I don't think, I'm not kidding, I don't think. I just, I know exactly what's happening. And when I don't, then I move on to the next chart. But when there's something, when, when I look at a chart, I'm, I don't think, I immediately know what's going on. It becomes like, you know, like you, if I were to see a friend walking down the street, a close friend of mine, I immediately recognize who they are. I don't think about who they are oh, and their life story and is it John, is it Josh, is it Adam, is it who, right? It's high quality. It's a high quality climactic, mini climactic that took out resistance, high quality. I played it from here to, to there. It made three R's. It dropped, it dropped uh, two more dollars. It dropped two more dollars. I mean, it dropped more. It dropped even more. Okay, so this was a high quality mini climax. 